Immunotherapy has led to some impressive results in cancer treatment, but not all cancers respond. Identifying those most likely to benefit from immunotherapy and managing the toxicities is an ongoing area of important investigation, and we're going to discuss this in lung cancer with one of the leaders in the field. Welcome to Project Oncology on ReachMD. I'm Dr. Jacob Sands, and joining me to discuss the role for immunotherapy in lung cancer treatment is Dr. Mark Awad, a thoracic medical oncologist and clinical director of the Lowe Center for Thoracic Oncology at the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute, and assistant professor of medicine at Harvard Medical School. Dr. Awad, welcome to the program. Thank you very much, Jake. I'm very happy to be here. Thanks for the invitation to join you today. So, Dr. Awad, we're going to get to some general discussion about immunotherapy in a moment, but first let's start with lung cancer treatment options. There have been various regimens, including immunotherapy alone or in combination with chemo, that have been approved for the treatment of lung cancer. Can you take us through your treatment algorithm? Sure, and this has been a very fast-moving and exciting field, and we're happy to have many treatment options to offer for our patients. And so, When we meet a new patient with advanced metastatic lung cancer, which unfortunately today is still the majority of new patients that we meet with stage four or metastatic lung cancer, we typically first break it down by histology. Does the patient have uh, squamous or non-squamous non-small cell lung cancer? And from there, depending on the histology, we tend to order advanced uh, molecular or genomic sequencing. So for most non-squamous, non-small cell lung cancers, we will order a next generation sequencing panel either on a tissue biopsy or from a plasma sample to assess circulating tumor DNA to look for an increasing number of targetable genomic alterations in genes like EGFR, ALK, ROS1, BRAF, MET, RET, NTRAC, HER2, and increasingly more and more markers with every passing year, including KRAS G12C now. And if a patient has a targetable genomic alteration, we tend to start with targeted therapy first. Typically, these are oral kinase inhibitors that are well-tolerated and highly active with high response rates. But still, the majority of patients with advanced non-small cell lung cancer will lack a targetable genomic alteration within their tumor. And for those patients, we tend to test pdl one by immunohistochemistry. And from there, that helps us to decide on the initial treatment plan. And for patients with non-small cell lung cancer and high pdl one expression, we tend to consider use of PD-1 inhibitor monotherapy. And for patients with low or absent pdl one expression, we tend to combine PD-1 with a platinum doublet chemotherapy. The cutoff that we tend to use now is based on several large phase three clinical trials, one of which is the Keynote 24 study, which used a pdl one tumor proportion score cutoff of 50% or greater. And for those patients, again, we tend to use pembrolizumab by itself. For patients who have a lower or negative pdl one expression, we would combine pembrolizumab with either platinum pemetrexid for non-squamous or platinum taxane for squamous histology. There are a number of other regimens that have been approved with immunotherapy alone or immunotherapy combinations, but that's the general approach for how we decide the initial treatment plan for patients with advanced non-small cell lung cancer. Excellent. So although many tolerate the treatment well, there are side effects that certainly can come up related to these therapies. So can you outline some of the potential adverse events and how you'd recommend handling them? Right. These therapies have been very promising and many studies show they've improved overall survival for patients. And as you said, they're generally well tolerated, but there are several unique and potentially serious or dangerous, even life-threatening adverse events that need to be monitored for carefully. And when I talk to patients prior to starting immune checkpoint inhibitors, I explain the mechanism of action, and I also let them know the therapy side effects that we will be monitoring for, but that they should also be monitoring for so that they can let us know if they're not feeling well. So We tend to see most patients with relatively minor side effects, such as maybe fatigue, some joint aches, maybe decreased appetite, some itching. But more serious immunologic adverse events are related to inflammation that happens in organs, even where the cancer is not present. The vast majority of these side effects are manageable and treatable with corticosteroids initially, which tends to dampen the 
immunologic adverse events for, from these therapies. I tell our patients, though, that some of the side effects that are treatable but not necessarily reversible are those that affect the endocrine organs. So, for example, if there is hypothyroidism that results from use of immune checkpoint inhibitors, we'll need to support those patients by offering thyroid replacement hormone. So many of these side effects are manageable, but there have been some cases of fatal toxicities reported in the literature, and particularly pneumonitis is uh, one of the more feared complications of immune checkpoint inhibitors. And we tell our patients to really let us know immediately if they're experiencing any new side effects so that we can assess them and, if necessary, intervene early. I think the earlier you catch these and treat them, the better. Excellent. Thank you. That's helpful in overviewing that. Now, related to that is autoimmune disease. So in the development of these trials, in many cases, those with autoimmune disease were not really included. And given the potential impact on the interaction of the immune system with normal cells, of course, that is a very reasonable initial concern. Do we now have data on this? And how much should autoimmune disorders impact decision making as far as treatment options? Right. These are really important questions. The clinical trials have generated a lot of data for us to learn from. However, as you mentioned, several important patient populations were excluded from these pivotal trials leading to approval of immune checkpoint inhibitors, such as patients with pre-existing autoimmune disease, patients with HIV, patients with active hepatitis B or C have been excluded, patients with organ transplant. And so after the approval of these drugs, we've been trying to learn as quickly as possible to understand how do these therapies perform in these populations that were ineligible or excluded from clinical trials. And we and others have looked um, to try to address this question in a retrospective fashion. So for patients who were not on clinical trials, but received immune checkpoint inhibitors with any variety of these conditions, we've looked to see how they have done. And there are some uh, biases in this type of analysis because perhaps oncologists uh, more carefully select which patients with autoimmune disease they are willing to treat with immunotherapy as compared to others. But what we and others have looked for is, number one, when these patients receive immunotherapies, does their autoimmune disease worsen or flare up? And secondly, do they have other or are they at greater risk for other immune-related adverse events? If patients have generally mild or well-controlled autoimmune disease, or their disease is quiescent and not requiring systemic therapy. Many patients are able to safely receive immune checkpoint inhibitors. And while we have seen some flares of their autoimmune disease, again, if we catch these relatively early or if we work closely with the patient's specialists, whether that's a rheumatologist or a gastroenterologist who's managing their disease, We are generally able to continue to treat with immunotherapy or to manage carefully with some dose interruptions or or dose holds and potentially use steroids for treating any adverse events. There are some cases, however, where we've seen more severe flares of their autoimmune disease or high-grade adverse events that are unrelated to the autoimmune disease. So I'd say that when I see a patient in clinic these days with a pre-existing autoimmune condition, I'm somewhat cautious still if they have certainly very active disease or they are requiring a number of systemic immunosuppressive therapies or regimens to keep their autoimmune disease under control. But if I don't have really any other options and we need to use immunotherapy to treat their metastatic cancer, I will certainly be in touch with the patient's care team, primary care physician, their rheumatologist or their other specialists to let them know our plan to start immunotherapy. And then we in oncology and their other specialists will be monitoring the patients very, very carefully to see how best we can detect the presence of autoimmune disease flare or other potential immune-related adverse events. For those just tuning in, you're listening to Project Oncology on ReachMD. I'm Dr. Jacob Sands, and I'm speaking about immunotherapy with Dr. Mark Awad, a thoracic medical oncologist and clinical director of the Lowe Center for Thoracic Oncology at the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute and assistant professor of medicine at Harvard Medical School. Now, Dr. Wad, you just highlighted some of the important things to consider around those with an autoimmune disease, but uh, another important 
area for consideration as far as trial enrollment was active infections. And in many cases, those with HIV have not been included. And of course, this is a bigger area of discussion, but specifically around immunotherapy. Can you outline any data related to active infections such as HIV or hepatitis C? This also is, is a really important topic because we know that patients with HIV are at greater risk for certain malignancies. There are also high rates of tobacco use um, among people living with HIV. And so lung cancer and other cancers continue to be a problem for populations like this. And the initial immune checkpoint inhibitor clinical trials excluded patients with HIV, regardless of whether their HIV was well controlled or managed with antiretroviral therapies. And the rationale at that time was that we don't know whether there could be some immunologic dysfunction in these patients and that perhaps immune therapies would not work as well in these pivotal phase three clinical trials. And so those patients were excluded. Now that these drugs are approved, again, we've been using them in a broader patient population, including patients living with HIV. And we've reported on this and others as well that patients living with HIV can do very well with immune checkpoint inhibitors. They tolerate the therapy well, similarly to individuals that do not have HIV. You can safely prescribe antiretroviral therapies. Currently, we don't necessarily see any higher risks of immune reconstitution symptoms or issues when antiviral therapies are started around the same time as immunotherapy. And we can still see uh, bona fide and, and durable responses to immune checkpoint inhibitors among patients living with HIV. We're also learning more about patients with hepatitis C and active hepatitis B, and particularly from the hepatocellular carcinoma literature where we know that viral hepatitis can be a risk factor for HCC or hepatocellular carcinoma. And again, in many cases, immune checkpoint inhibitors can be administered quite safely and effectively in patients with these active viral infections. Of course, now we've got really terrific therapies to treat viral hepatitis. And so when we have patients with active hep B or hep C, I tend again to work with our hepatology or infectious disease colleagues to see if we can manage those active viral infections while we're also managing their malignancy with immunotherapies. So these are big topics requiring additional study and additional awareness, as well as advocacy, because many of our patients who have these other medical conditions or comorbidities do not have access to current and modern clinical trials, unfortunately. Well, ongoing advances in cancer treatment are obviously still needed, but it has been exciting to see some of the advances that have happened with immunotherapy. I want to thank my guest, Dr. Awad, for providing an overview of important considerations for immunotherapy treatment. Dr. Awad, absolute pleasure to have you on the program. Pleasure is mine. Thank you so much for the invitation. I'm Dr. Jacob Sands. To access this and other episodes in our series, visit reachmd.com slash project oncology where you can be part of the knowledge. Thanks for listening.